Picture yourself in a battlefield. You know it's intense and you're about to be attacked. I had, I would like to take a rest. These are not the words that you'd like to hear at this point of your life. But you know what? You have been in such a similar situation in the last 29 years of your age, but you felt composed, calm, and collected because you knew that the commander was in charge and you protected. So while still at the battlefield, this commander comes forth and says, guys, you know what? I am tired. I would like to take out. 22nd of March, 2014, we had a family function in Taita. I come from Taita Taveta County. I'm the second born in a family of five. I have two brothers and two sons. And I'm the second born in my family, and I'm the eldest daughter of my family. <clears throat> my father has suffered stroke in 2007, and it was his morning routine or daily routine. He'd wake up and do exercises on the veranda. Every morning you woke up, you will hear him on the veranda. He never recovered fully, so he used his walking stick. So we'll hear the sound, T, 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 and you knew my father was up. So this particular morning, my mom was already in the kitchen preparing breakfast for us. My siblings were already up and about, and I've always been the sleepy baby of the family, so I wake up a long time after everyone else has woken up. So we went out, and then I saw my dad on the veranda, and then we met. He looked at me and said, which simply says, did you sleep well, mom? He fondly called us mommy, the three of us, his daughters. I looked at him and said, yes, I did sleep well. And you? How are you today? My father looked at me, and then he started crying. And crying he did. For the last 29 years of my age, I swear, I had never seen my father break down completely. If anything, I didn't even think my father had tears. It had never crossed my mind at all that one day, this ninja, that this commander, could actually break down. So he did. So here he was with his walking stick. I'm looking at him. I'm like, huh? So you can cry. And then I started crying, and I just, to there. On, hear him, on hearing him cry, my big brother came out, and he went straight to help him. He just came out. And I think his assumption was maybe my father had fallen down or something, but then there I was crying. So my brother tried to support him back to the living room where my father to the court. And as he did, my brother at this point was also in tears. Then my siblings, who were also, I think, up, up and about doing something, they also heard my father cry, and they came, and there we were. The five of us plus daddy crying. If that morning, I think maybe a guest could come, then the question would be, okay, so daddy and children, why are you crying? What is the problem? And then one by one, we started back to our bedroom, still in tears, and my father was still sitting there crying. But of course, we could not believe it, and we could not stay there and cry with him. At this particular moment, my mom had come, and all I could hear from the bedroom is my mom asked, what is the problem? Are you in pain? What is it? But my father could not answer. All he could do was continue sobbing. First track, the events two weeks later, exactly two weeks later, on the 7th of April, 2014, my brother briefed his last. And that marked the end of him. As many imagined. <clears throat> My father died on a Monday morning, slightly after 10 a.m. And trust me, five days later, until my father was married, I had not slept. Even for, even for a second. I don't know what happened, but something happened and I just felt numb. I woke up, the day passed, Tuesday was there. I was in Nairobi with my two siblings, who I call my babies, my babies' siblings, 
last uh, second last one uh, the last one sister who is here with me but we were busy preparing for Matt's burial he was in Mombasa and he's going to be buried in Taita on Saturday those who know me know that I love my sleep and I treasure my sleep I'm the kind of a girl who goes home on Friday very tired I sleep at 10 and set my alarm for 10 in the morning my alarm rings at 10 and I'm like, oh my God, it's already 10. No, I still need two more hours. And then I add another two hours and go back to sleep. For those five days, I'll be fine. <laughs> I never slept. One, I think I was in denial. At the same time, I was very shattered. I was in disbelief. No one had ever prepared me for my dad's death. And no one had ever prepared me for my parents. I'm the kind of a person who also believed the five of us were going to be intact all through my life. I knew my right to have my parents intact. And then here I was, I got the news that my father is no more. So, and I started thinking of the events that happened. One, I could not get away the picture of him crying. This commander that I had truly trusted in had begged to rest. And there he was, he shed tears for the first time in my life, and I saw it. <clears throat> to me, my father was my unsung hero. Never mind that drove him crazy like any other girl would do, and especially during teenagehood. <laughs> we did not agree on many things. But you know what? He's on unconditional love. My father loved us unconditionally. Look back now, I know, it just meant pure love. And not just for me, but the five of us. I really wanted to be like my dad in many ways. My father was such a hard-working man, and I mean exactly that. And that meant we never lacked. We had quite a privileged childhood. And that, for that, I'm very grateful. All the time I look back and I think of all the privileges we had, it's because my father worked extremely hard. At any given, of, any given time of his life, my father had like three businesses. My father operated Matatu business. For those who have been in that kind of business, you know what it means. A <laughs> thing. <laughs> and he was such a good micromanager. It's not a good thing to be, but yes, my father was such a good micromanager. Any time he knew Matatu X is at this place, where this conductor is, how much money has been at what time of the day, and at the time you came back in the evening and said, this is the money we made today, he knew what time, how much you have stolen, because he was tracking you almost throughout the day. <laughs> My father had a rich shop. That also meant, at any given moment, he knew what, was, what stock was there, he knew how much salt packets are there, he knew how much water was there, you know, and how much needed to be replaced by who's, which liar at any given moment. And then he loved farming. His shamba was always green, regardless of wherever he was. He worked as a railway station master, or rather he worked for the Kenya Railways, so that meant he went for transfers. If you know Samburu in Mombasa, it's quite a dry place. But the moment my father got there, the place changed, especially his own area. It became very green. And then, in his shamba, we always had skumawiki and tomatoes. And because of that, we all love kachumbari. <laughs> because why? Every time you felt hungry before lunch hour or before dinner, my mom will say, nenda pale utafute panadol. Panadol meant what? Go there and pluck some tomatoes, and then come into the house and make some salad for you. For you. So even now, we see me to Raz, I only see kachumbari. I go from Dura, but the reason is I just really want kachumbari. <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, so I think about all those things, and those are good memories. When my father suffered stroke in 2007, he was admitted, I remember very well, for almost a month at the, at the Khan Hospital in Mombasa. The biggest fight between him and the nurses was for him to put down his phone so that he could get some rest. But all he wanted to do was to micromanage everything else, even in his sick bed. That was my dad. He set standards for us, and that excelling in school was not up for debate. 
You had to be number one, number two, number three, period. Nothing more, nothing less. Anytime you're beyond those numbers, you had not worked hard. So this is what happened. And therefore, every time I just wanted to go to school, to work hard, to be number one, number two, number three, so that I could please my dad. So with his departure, I felt really lonely. I looked at my phone and realized I had no purpose anymore. He cheered me on, and he was so proud of my little achievements. I'm a journalist by profession, though now I do media consultancy, and I also work for a human rights organization. I started off as a radio presenter in Barak FM Mombasa. And my father was so happy to listen to me, and also to tell me that so-and-so say they listen to me. So he was very happy to hear people tune in just to listen. So with his departure, my life kind of stopped. I'm not suicidal, so that did not cross my mind. However, I felt... Is it fine? My life had come to an end. I woke up and asked God once, what is this life all about? What is it that you work so hard like my dad did and then one day, just like that, you're gone? So I thought about many things. I thought about how about I look for a way to start celebrating my dad and to start thinking about him coming back one day. So picture your loved ones who've gone before you. And then one day they will be back. That one day they will come and join you again. But that was not true, because every day I slept, every day I woke up, it was another day. Days came and went. Weeks came and went. Months came and went. And before I knew it, it was one year. So the truth is, my dad was not coming back anymore. He was gone, and that was for a fact. So what I did, I started accepting the situation. <clears throat> to believe in it that my father will not be back at any given point of my life. And that changed my life. It was hard, it was a painful process, but yes, I knew for sure he's not going to be back any time of my life. And therefore, I had to fight my life. But you know what? God has been good to us and to my family. A lot has happened since left us. We now have additional members in our family. My mom has two grandchildren. That means I'm an aunt to two. I have a niece and a nephew that I really adore, that I really, really love. And my mom has remained the rock that binds us in prayer. So I know it is tough, yes, there's light at the end of the tunnel. So I chose to change my story. I said, looking at myself, I said, you know what? This is painful, yes, but again, I have, uh, let me find my purpose in living. Let me see what it is that I can do. And if my father was going to come back today, I still want him to be very proud of me and of the woman I have come, I've become. I still want him to look at me and get amazed and say, wow, you made all those decisions, life decisions for yourself? Because I was so used to contacting my dad. I was so used, every time I wanted to make something that I thought was risk-taking, or something that I thought was really above me, I would call my dad. And if my dad said yes, then I was going to do it. I resigned from Baraka FM two years after, after, after I started working. And I recently met a friend who told me, you know, I looked at how far you have come, then I remember the, the, the time you told us you're resigning. We sat down and spoke about you, and we said, you know, this girl has a future, but I don't know what she's running to do in more Nairobi, because I really wanted to resign and come to Nairobi. I thought Mombasa was too small. So they all told me, stop. You work in Barak FM, Barak FM frequency gets up to Kibwezi at the most. Beyond Kibwezi, no one knows you. So you might think you're a celebrity in Mombasa, but you know what? No one knows you past Kibwezi. It's gonna be tough for you. But what they didn't know is, I had made a pact with my dad. I had spoken to my dad and told him about my ambition to go back to Nairobi to do my master's one, and two, to get myself a job in Nairobi because he thought I had bigger and not just in Mombasa. 
and I felt Barak FM was small for me. So my father said, I give you all my blessings. If you go and it backfires, this shop can become you. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, as small as it felt, you know, I have a plan B. I'm going to go to Nairobi to try it out. It fails. I'm going to go back home and help my father with his retail shop. So I started accepting the situation that my father was gone and gone for good. I started looking at my life and decided to make decisions for myself. Many a times I have made decisions that even for me they have perplexed me. I wake up and I'm like, oh wow, did I do, did I do this for myself? Did I decide this for myself? And I also feel some power that I'm like, hey, now I could do it even without consulting him. I went for counseling and finally I found a condition just randomly from a video clip. And this is what it said. People, I have stopped worrying about people and things that are not with me. I've stopped worrying about people and things that I have lost. Simply because people and things that are meant to be with me at this particular point of my life are with me. And in case my father was going to come back today, I want him to come back and say, wow, this is exactly the guy I envisioned. And so I choose to live my life to the fullest. My dad, his memories I treasure forever, and therefore his legacy lives forever.